All right, so we have seen two homomorphic systems in this lecture. So we have seen that the RSA encryption is homomorphic, and we have seen that Algamala encryption is homomorphic. And again, don't use homomorphic systems unless you're actually using the homomorphism. So normally a homomorphism is an attack tool. Normally the homomorphism means you cannot reach uh, CCA2 security, so in CCA2 security in particular. And so you shouldn't use it unless you actually want it. But if you want a homomorphic crypto system, chances are that actually what you want is to be able to add the messages by doing operation on the ciphertext, rather than what Algomal and RSA offer you, which is to multiply the messages. Payee's crypto system is very nice in that it allows you to do exactly that. So it's an additively homomorphic crypto system. And it's also intellectually stimulating because it nicely combines features from the RSA crypto system and from the Algamal or like discrete log crypto systems. So let's jump right in. So the key generation starts a little bit like uh, RSA key generation. So you're picking two large primes, P and Q, so that they're not the same. And you're computing, well, N exactly the same as N. RSA is P times Q, and then phi of N, the order phi function, is P minus one times Q minus one. In addition, we will need the inverse of phi of n mod n. And, well, if p and q are large primes of about the same size, then phi of n is invertible mod n. And then finally, we're putting g equals to n plus 1. Now, this seems a bit of a redundant information. That is correct. So if everybody uses Payet with this same g, your public key just needs to be n. But there are some generalizations where you're picking random g's with certain properties, which, well, these properties are satisfied by n plus 1. Um, and so for compatibility, you should have the g as well. So the public key is this n, g, and the private key is n, phi of n, and v. Now to encrypt a message m, so similar to RSA, you want that your messages go prime to n, but n is an RSA modulus, and so it's going to happen. So no, no GCD there is going to reveal a factor, so the GCD of m and n for any message you could possibly be wanting to send is going to be 1. And also the next step when you're asked to pick a random number less than, G, uh, less than n with the GCD being parent n v1, again, this, is, this GCD condition is essentially always satisfied. And then comes our ciphertext. So the computation is you're taking this g, which was part of my public key, to the power m, which is your message, times this random choice r to the power of n. So n is the other part of the public key. And then this whole thing mod n squared. So watch out, here the computation is mod n squared. So we're now in the integers modulo n squared, not in R, as in RSA in the integers modulo n. So on the downside, this means that your C is larger. It's, well, twice the length as an RSA uh, number. On the other hand, um, well, it's a randomized text, so it also has its own features. And, well, you want an additively had a homomorphic system? This is how you get it. All right, I'll show you how decryption works, but I'll postpone proving that it actually is correct. So the steps in decryption is you're getting the ciphertext. It's a number between 0 and, well, less than n squared. And you're first raising it to the phi of nth power. Remember, we're working mod n squared. We're not working mod n. If you're working mod n, this will just be 1. That's very boring. But this is modulo n squared, and so this does not map everything to 1. This is d which we're getting there. Um, when you look at it, and we're going to do that later, is a multiple of n when you look at it as an integer. So we can, sorry, d minus 1 is a multiple of n. So we can take d minus 1 and divide by n. So this e that we're seeing there is an integer. And well, if you have an integer, we can consider it as an integer mod n. So the last fourth step there is you take this e times the last part on your private key, like this mu, the, the inverse of phi of n mod n, and that product gives you the message. We're going to go through why m prime equals m, but here are just the steps of how it works. And let me first sell you on the features. Let me first show you why we care about this. So the, the claim is that this encryption operation is homomorphic. So if you're having two ciphertexts, C1 and C2, so C1 being the uh, encryption of M1 and C2 being the encryption of M2, these are potentially by different people and so on. Uh, but they're still the same, um, they're the same user, so the same public key. So both use the same G and both use the same M. 
Now, if you multiply these two ciphertexts, let me sort those by powers of g and powers of r. So we have in g to the m1 times g to the m2 times r to the r1 to the n and r2 to the n. Okay, I can combine those. So I'm seeing there a g to the m1 plus m2, and yes, this is the additive part. Sort of obviously, if the message is in the exponent, you're multiplying the bases, then you're adding in the exponent. So yes, you get an additive operation on the messages. And then, well, this is a valid encryption. The valid encryption says, well, you have to pick some r, and here the r is r1 times r2, and so we have an r1 times r2 to the power of n. So this is a valid encryption of m1 plus m2. And so somebody who, well, wants to aggregate all these ciphertexts so that the decryption only reveals a sum, can just multiply all the ciphertexts. So it's also very nice that you have a compression of ciphertexts. So instead of having two ciphertexts, three, and so on, if all you care about is a sum of those, you only have to remember, well, you only have to store one ciphertext, and then you transform them. So, does it actually work? So here is again the decryption routine, and I've also put in the caption there what the ciphertext was. So the ciphertext has this m in the gth power. Now before we can see that this is correct, we have to do a little bit of groundwork. So the um, integers mod n squared, if you look at the numbers which are co-prime to n squared, so the multiple group z star mod n squared, so, sorry, star probably should be on the outside of this thing, then um, how many elements are there? So phi of n squared, that is p squared minus p times q squared minus q, or I can just take p and q outside these parentheses, and then what I'm getting is n times phi of n. Okay, so this is the order, or this is the size of the group, so any element has order dividing this number. So if you pick some element like the g here, um, which is co-prime to n squared, then um, it is has order dividing n times phi of n. Now my claim is that this g in particular has order n. Okay, but let's remember that g was n plus 1. So if you compute g to the n, what we have is n plus 1 to the power n. And then just use the binomial formula to expand this. So we're starting with 1 plus. Now the exponent many times the other part. So it's n times n there, and oh, this already gives us an n squared. And afterwards, it's n choose 2 times n squared, and so we're getting more and more uh, powers of, of n. Since we're computing this whole thing mod n squared, that's what the group says, we're in the integers mod n squared, um, all of these terms will just be 0 mod n squared. So this is coming to 1 mod n squared. Okay, so we now know that g does not have order larger than n. Doesn't, we don't have a proof yet that g itself has order n. Well, the divisors of n are p and q. And there's actually, well, there's no distinction between p and q, so I'll show you now for p, which also then works the same for q. So if I look at, does this have order p? So I'm computing this thing to the power of p. If it has order p or 1, then this already should give 1. So I'm doing the same expansion with binomial formulas there, but I need an extra term, because the first term is the exponent, which is p, times n, which is not yet 0 mod n squared because the q is missing. And then the next term, well, that is getting the p shoes 2, and then we have the n squared just from the, from the powers there. And so every term afterwards has a larger power of n. So everything towards the right is 0 mod n squared. And so the whole thing is congruent to 1 plus p times n, which is not the same as 1. And again, if I would be doing this with q, it would be the same result. So the order of g is really n. So now we've done the groundwork, and now we can see uh, what is happening in these steps. So let's start with step one. We're computing d. So d is a ciphertext to the power of phi of n, and the phi is uh, up in the caption, so that's g to the m times r to the n to the phi of n. And let's look at the r term first. We're seeing an r, which was a random integer mod n squared, and that is to the n times phi of n. But that is the full phi of n squared, and by this theorem, any r to the phi of well, any r to the phi of n squared modulo n squared is one. So this term here is just one. So that goes away, and then what we're left with is g to the 
m times phi of m. And now I'm using again that I know that g is n plus 1. And I'm doing again this binomial expansion. All right, so I'm again getting 1 plus the exponent times n. So what we have here is 1 plus m plus phi of n times n, so times phi of n times n, and then whatever coefficient times n squared and then n cubed, etc., etc. So model n squared, it is 1 plus m phi of n, n. So you observe that this is multiple of n if I'm taking minus 1. So d minus 1 is a multiple of n, so we can divide, so we can compute this e as an integer, and then e is, well, we got rid of this thing, we got rid of the 1, so it is congruent to m times phi of n modulo n. And then the last step here, part 4, we're multiplying this m prime by mu. And mu, you should remember, that was the inverse of phi of n mod n. Okay, so all together, out comes n. So Payer's encryption system does work. So the decryption of the encryption of m gives us m back. And then, well, what are our secrets here? Our secrets are this phi of n, and well, if you have phi of n, you can compute phi of n inverse. Um, so that is then similar to the RSA crypto system that you would need to compute phi of n given n. And you know that you can do this with factoring. It might be possible otherwise, but we don't know anything more efficient. If you're trying to do an attack on the message, so if you're looking at the ciphertext and you're trying to figure out what the message is, um, that looks a little bit like a discrete log problem. And it's a discrete log problem in a group of unknown order, which is at least as hard as a discrete log problem in a group of known order. And since this n has to be large enough so that a factorization is hard, you're also looking at something with a discrete log problem. All right, so that's all I wanted to say about the Payet system. So you have now seen two systems which have a multiplicative homomorphism and one which has an additive homomorphism. And again, only use it should you need it. But if you want one, here we go.